know-how, knowledge of current trends, and effective SEL technologies, as well as cutting-edge tools to bring leads fast and effectively. Most importantly, we deliver innovative digital marketing strategies customized to your company's exact needs. Take a decisive step. Combine your, our powerful tools with your company's products and services and increase your revenue now. Hey, Lindsay, where's Pamela? She was attacked by the monster that eventually gets all senior scientists. Her software segmentation faulted? No. No, that's what happens to grad students. She had a telecon, so today you get me. Since when did they start letting tiny interns on air? Look here. You were still in middle school when I got the Twitter handle, I think. So I think I've earned my chance to tell all these good folks about the volcanoes and solar orbiter and maybe even Mars. Well, I I'm telling them about Mars. We'll split Mars. Fine. Starliner's all mine. And Pamela pre-recorded a review of Galaxy the Prettiest Star. All of this and more right here on The Daily Space. I'm your host, Eric Mattis. And I'm your host, Lindsay Odom. And we're here to put science in your brain. Something many of us weren't convinced was actually going to happen, finally happened. Boeing successfully sent their CSD-100 Starliner to the International Space Station and back as part of the Orbital Flight Test 2, or OFT-2, mission. For those of you who don't remember, OFT-1 was not the most successful mission, and OFT-2 had a few less than stellar early attempts at liftoff. Back in December 2019, OFT-1 was a, quote, high-visibility close call due to, due to the numerous issues with everything from the flight software to reaction control thrusters. It was unable to dock to the ISS. After that spacecraft limped home, Boeing said that they would do an OFT-2. It had the usual delays before finally rolling out to the pad. The first real launch attempt for that was August 2021 but it was called off six hours before launch due to valve problems. Half of the valves that controlled the reaction control thrusters were corroded shut. The root cause, water intrusion. Someone didn't take into consideration humidity with the spacecraft launched from Florida. The fix for this problem delayed launch from August 2021 to May 2022. And then there were the issues that you just have to laugh at, like the protective window cover that yoked off as they rolled the capsule down the street. Somehow, despite all of these issues, OFT-2 managed to lift off on May 19th, 2022. While the craft did lift off, it was not without issues that had Pamela, who was not here, so I can say this, totally shaking her head. For instance, the cooling loop got a little bit too cold and iced up. Turns out if you don't have four living, breathing things in the capsule producing heat, your cooling loop needs to be adjusted down. Also, two of the three thrusters in one doghouse of thrusters failed in the first hour of the flight, but the other thrusters in the three other doghouses were able to compensate. As the capsule got closer to the International Space Station and prepared to cross the imaginary boundary of the 200 meter keep out sphere, they had to pause for an extended period of time while engineers worked to troubleshoot an issue with a soft capture ring on the spacecraft's NASA docking system. That ring is the three blades that extended out of the port and help roughly align and manage the loads when it contacts the station's docking port. It also corrects for slight misalignments. The nature of the issue was not clear, but retracting and extending the soft capture ring fixed the issue and Starliner proceeded further in. But then, Starliner had to pause again, because lighting conditions weren't sufficient to actually dock. 
For over an hour, the capital held station just 90 meters away from the docking port. So close, and so very, very far. Eventually, Starliner was able to dock, and here we do have moment of goodness and light. Boeing left the astronauts a neat surprise. The spacecraft zero gravity indicator was a plus Jebediah Kerman from the video game Triple Space Program. Jebediah received lots of positive feedback from space nerds across the social internet, something Boeing sorely needed with all of the issues and delayed encountered by the spacecraft. I have to admit that I've got some real mixed feels about Jebediah being the zero-g indicator. At a certain level, my experience with KSB isn't all that different from Boeing's with Starliner. Sometimes you succeed in spite of serious design and operational issues, and you learn from your mistakes. I hope Boeing learned. Mostly, I'm just unsurprised to see a defense contractor pander to space nerds. Still, I admit, I found where to get one of the plushies and bought one for myself. I'm not immune to consumerism, particularly when cute things are involved. Just ask Tiny Intern, who sends me links to opossum stuff all the time. Also, Tiny, get ready, you're next. Back on topic. Starliner stayed at the ISS for several days, demonstrating that it can stay powered down attached to the station like it will need to do for a six-month operational mission. Starliner successfully returned to Earth the evening of Wednesday, May 25th carrying some cargo back to White Sands Missile Range in New Mexico. Like the first mission, reentry and the parachute deployments were nominal. Among the cargo on return were some empty gas canisters used for the station's atmosphere. Like the Soyuz, Starliner returns to a landing on solid ground, but instead of the small rockets used by the Soyuz and New Shepard, Starliner uses airbags for the final touchdown. Assuming the data review goes well, and all indications are that it will, Starliner will fly its crew flight test later this year, with its first operational mission in 2023. There are finally two U.S. spacecraft capable of sending crew to and from the ISS, the goal of the commercial crew program started over a decade ago. And, if things don't go well for the data review, there's always a spacecraft getting ready to fly, the Sierra Nevada Dream Chaser. Expect to hear more on that little space plane as 2023 approaches. A few episodes back, we brought you the story of how a NASA satellite spotted an erupting shark cano, an underwater volcano in the Solomon Islands that is, or was, filled with sharks. Today we have news of another volcano behaving badly. This time it's the Nyaragongo volcano in the Democratic Republic of Congo. No one has eyes on all the seas or the right perspective into the lava spewing mountains that pox our planet. However, new research published in the Journal of Geophysical Research, Solid Earth, uses synthetic aperture radar data from satellites to measure the level of the lava lake at the peak of the mountain. All of this data collected can now be used to predict volcanic hazards to the region. So, while the total population of satellites may seem to be becoming overwhelming, science can use every mission we can get, and even as an amateur astronomer, I'm still grateful for the telescopes that are pointing down. Heck, it even turns out that I get giddy about telescopes pointed at the sun. On March 26th, ESA's solar orbiter made its closest approach to the sun and reached an external temperature of about 500 degrees Celsius, or 900 degrees Fahrenheit. This spacecraft has the ultimate in heat shielding technology that allows the mission to survive to do science, science that includes flying over the sun's north and south poles. The solar orbiter has also captured our highest resolution image yet of the sun's south pole. These images are super exciting, but the roughly eight weeks since the encounter hasn't been enough time for researchers to learn what solar science is revealed in this new data. For that, we're just going to have to wait. In the meantime, we can talk about some scientific results coming out of various Mars missions. Stay tuned. As a photographer, one of the targets on my bucket list is the northern lights. As the sun ramps up into a solar maximum, the chance of the aurora reaching where I live is increasing, so that's good. More solar activity means more aurora, which are all told pretty common here on Earth. But today I learned that there are also aurora on Mars, which doesn't really make sense to me as Mars doesn't have a global magnetic field as Earth does. Still, NASA's MAVEN spacecraft has discovered over 200 so-called discrete aurora, which only occur in the southern hemisphere of the Red Planet. 
And physicists have analyzed those observations and discovered that the solar wind, which causes aurora on Earth, is interacting with localized bits of crustal magnetic fields to create the discrete aurora. Co-author Zachary Girazian explains, quote, our main finding is that inside the strong crustal field region, the aurora occurrence rate depends mostly on the orientation of the solar wind magnetic field, while, outso- while outside the strong crustal region, the occurrence rate depends mostly on the solar wind dynamic pressure. So while Mars doesn't have a global magnetic field, there is enough magnetic field generating regions in the southern hemisphere to interact with the solar wind. And now you know. Uh, wow. I would love to get a photo of an aurora on Mars. While one team of scientists has solved a Martian mystery, a different team has kind of created another one. Here's what we know. Once upon a time, a long, long time ago, Mars had water. Enough water that even today, we can still see the effects of flowing rivers and streams on the landscape. Perseverance's landing place, Jezero Crater, was once even a lake. Then, at some point in Mars history, all that water went away. And since our first orbital images of Mars were captured, even before Dr. Pamela was born, scientists have been trying to understand just why Mars lost its water and became the desert planet it is now. In a new paper published in Science Advances, a team led by geophysical scientist Edwin Kite analyzed the tracks of those rivers and created a timeline of the changes in elevation and even latitude of the flowing water. They used all that data to run simulations and they found Well, they found that changing the amount of carbon dioxide did exactly nothing. Carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas, which means the presence of CO2 in the atmosphere helps warm a planet. Losing that CO2 is a great explanation for why Mars water was able to dissipate out to space, or froze and ended up underground, except carbon dioxide loss is clearly not the reason Mars dried out. Scientists working on this project are now planning to use both the Curiosity and Percy rovers to study their respective landing zones, for evidence to support a different explanation. And we'll, of course, update you when they learn more. Just what do you think you understand a planet? Oh wait, another paper in Science Advances explains a different Martian phenomena, the constant atmospheric haze. An international team of researchers studied data from 216 souls, Martian days, worth of perseverance observation on air pressure, temperature, and wind speed. And the result is that dust stays aloft on Mars because of dust devils. First, it's aurora, and now it's dust devils. Mars is awesome! It turns out that dust devils actually occur pretty frequently on the red planet, with at least one popping up near Percy every day. And those swirling bits of dust are one of the reasons that the air is hazy. They help replenish that dust that may have settled. Plus, there are also upslope winds that, while less common, pull in more dust into the atmosphere. Between the two processes, Mars gets to stay hazy much of the time. As the red planet heads into its winter season, the frequency of larger dust storms will increase, making sure that the atmosphere remains hazy. That's why we're losing insight, and probably ingenuity, this year. All that dust also blocks out the sunlight that charges their batteries via solar panels. So, two out of three Mars stories answered their questions, not a bad record. And now we're going to present Dr. Pamela's pre recorded review of Galaxy Prettiest Star. Stay tuned. Around the Daily Space team, we're willing to do a review of anything that can be somehow, vaguely, kind of sort of related to astronomy. From starlight coke to shoes covered in space patterns, we've strayed far and wide. Today's pick, well, we picked it because of the title and really didn't expect to find any clear science. And I'm here to say, this story has better science than its title led me to expect. Today, I review one of DC Comics' latest graphic novels, Galaxy, the Prettiest Star. Written by Jadzia Axelrod, with illustrations by Jess Taylor and lettering by Ariana Mayer, this story is set in a world where Superman keeps Metropolis safe. But the small towns beyond the city are still places where anything other than a beaver cleaver or Brady Bunch reality is something other than acceptable. 
It is in this kind of a rural nothing of a place that a boy named Taylor lives an invisible life with a picture book family. The thing about picture books is they only show what people want others to see. The true moments of life are often left out and maybe not even photographed. The picture Taylor and his family paint, it's not real. Taylor, as we can guess from the cover of this vibrantly colored work of art, is actually a beautiful alien, a stunning girl forced to hide herself in another body to hide from things that might hurt her. Released under DC Comics' Pride logo, this story is an allegory for the life of someone growing up trans and trying to find the courage to let the world see them for who they are. Again, this is a detail you can get from the cover, in this case from a cover quote from Nicole Maines. I went into this story thinking I had an idea of the plot and a notion of the ending and I was really expecting a surprise free ride along a comfortable known path. And to a degree, that's what I got. A story of candy colored joy mixed with the angst of being a teenager and the struggle of figuring out how to grow up and be true to yourself. But it is in the details that this story shines. When Taylor becomes her alien self, she loves pickle juice. And that's the kind of detail that if you know, you know. And it's awesome. And there is science. The story is set in a town with a radio observatory and the point is made that there are no cell phone towers and Wi-Fi just isn't a thing. And that is all correct for towns with radio observatories. And there are poetic allusions to physics and art and how with the right senses our science could be heard like an orchestra that shapes our reality. And there are descriptions of galaxies that are heartbreaking in their beauty. I, I want to read you a brief section that is going to be my new way to see our universe. Asselrod writes, quote, Galaxies are essentially island universes, isolated pockets of brightness and activity in the darkness. Stars, gases, dust, and dark matter swirling around together, held close by invisible bonds, all spinning around an unsteady center. A galaxy is not one thing, it can't be. It's made up of too many disjointed parts." End quote. There is science in this book. The first of what I hope will become a new series. And that science is true, and it is beautiful. But more importantly, the characters in all their flaws and in all their strength, they too are true. And this story is a beautiful introduction to what could be DC's newest superhero, Galaxy, who was called the prettiest star. And haven't we all once or twice mistaken a quasar for a beautiful star? This graphic novel is available wherever comic books are sold assuming they aren't sold out yet. We encourage you to get a copy or order a copy at your local comic book store. And failing that, well, we have links to order it online, all on our website, dailyspace.org. This has been The Daily Space. And I'm pre-recording this, so I'm gonna go ahead and say, you can find more information on all our stories, including images, at dailyspace.org. Today's show is full of my favorite types of science, from volcanoes to debunking asteroid clickbait. Also, black holes and how asteroids are apparently busier than thought in the early solar system. And a computer tells us that some hard math is worth doing. At least it didn't promise us cake. This week in rocket history, we look back at NASA's second crewed orbital flight, Mercury Atlas 7. All of this now, right here on The Daily Space. I'm your host, Dr. Pamela Gay. 
I'm your host, Eric Metz. And we're here to put science in your brain. Before I get into today's first story, I just want to say that today is a day when science news has gotten, somehow, even more weird than normal. My news day started with word from NASA that a shark cano was erupting in the Solomon Islands. Apparently underwater, Kavachi Volcano is home to a population of sharks that are adapted to live in hot, acidic waters, and they thrive there. Or did. We don't know. The volcano is currently erupting. Folks, today's news. It's weird. I present case in point, story one. Apparently dwarf galaxies have been hiding supermassive black holes. Or at least massive black holes. When you're a dwarf galaxy, you can only hide so much. In a new paper appearing in the Astrophysical Journal, Reese Researchers led by the student professor pair Magda Palerma and Sheila Kanapin have uncovered evidence of massive black holes in star-forming dwarf galaxies. These 1,000 to 100,000 solar mass black holes are being caught in the act of consuming gas and dust, and the light released from material on its way toward their event horizons is largely lost to the light of surrounding star formation. But with careful study, this team was able to tease apart the specific colors of light from star formation and from stardust consumption. Researchers have been studying dwarf galaxies near our Milky Way for decades, searching high and low for evidence of these middling-sized black holes. But so far, definitive evidence just hasn't been found. This could, in part, be due to the old age of most of these systems. Older dwarf galaxies don't have a lot of material to feed a black hole. But by looking at more active dwarf systems, these researchers had a lot more interference to deal with, but also had a chance to catch activity. As explained by Knappen, quote, Just like fireflies, we see black holes only when they're lit up, when they're growing and the lit up ones give us a clue to how many we can't see." End quote. Star formation is just a phase galaxies grow through. If, as this team did, you look at a bunch of star forming dwarf galaxies and find the majority show signs of having massive black holes, you know that the majority of dwarf galaxies in general should have massive black holes. These results are super pleasing. Researchers had been struggling to understand how merging dwarf galaxies could build supermassive black holes as they combined into larger systems. If they didn't start out with larger black holes that could merge together, some mechanism for building a supermassive black hole from scratch was needed. Now, well, that problem was solved. While not part of the search for black holes in dwarf galaxies, Hubble has conveniently released a stunning new image of a star-forming dwarf irregular system, Minkowski's object. This galaxy is located near the cotton ball-like NGC 541. This particular dwarf galaxy is being prodded into star formation through interactions with jets from NGC 541. Not visible in these images, those jets glow in the radio. As near as scientists can tell, the jet triggered a large intragalactic cloud of gas and dust to collapse, and that cloud was big enough to form an entire galaxy. An entire galaxy that 
looks like a spray of glitter and splatter of paint. Galaxies come in all shapes and sizes. With this next weird news, the headline around the internet somehow aren't all saying, oh my god, an asteroid, but they could have been. On Friday, May 27th, one good-sized chunk of rock is going to pass pretty close to the Earth, but not so close you can see it with your unaided eyes. And when we say close approach, we mean that asteroid 1989JA will be at its closest at about 4 million kilometers away, or 10 times the distance to the moon. Granted, it's going to be the largest asteroid to come close-ish to the Earth this year, measuring about a kilometer across. If 1989JA were to hit the Earth, yeah, that would be devastating. After all, the small body is traveling at 50,000 kilometers per hour. Or, as our friend Frank Manchus at the SETI Institute notes, quote, to provide some context, that is 17 times the speed of a bullet through the air. At this speed, the asteroid could travel around the planet Earth in 45 minutes." End quote. Once again, 1989 JA is not going to hit the Earth, or even pass all that close. And this is the closest the asteroid will get for the next 172 years, so we can probably forget about it after Friday until the next potentially hazardous asteroid makes headlines. And now, let's talk about star systems, including our own. Stay tuned. Here in our own galaxy, astronomers and planetary scientists continue to work toward understanding how planets formed and how the system evolved over time. One of the more useful objects for this kind of research is the Humble asteroid. When not actively threatening our existence, asteroids provide us with a snapshot of the early days of our solar system. In a new study in Nature Astronomy, scientists used radioactive isotopes to determine the age of some of these asteroids by sampling meteorites. As lead author Allison Hunt notes, quote, Previous scientific studies showed that asteroids in the solar system have remained relatively unchanged since their formation, billions of years ago. They, therefore, are an archive in which the conditions of the early solar system are preserved." End quote. The analysis process is kind of amazing. When the metallic cores of asteroids formed, they were heated by radioactive decay. The team took samples of meteorites, rocks from space, dissolved them to better isolate elements such as silver, platinum, and palladium, and then measured the isotope abundances of each element. First, they calculated the present-day ratio of silver isotopes, which begin to accumulate as the metallic cores cool down. This value told the team both how quickly the asteroids cooled and when the process started. As a result, they found that the cores cooled rapidly, likely as a result of collisions with other protoplanetary bodies. Those collisions stripped off the exteriors of the asteroids, exposing the core to a very chilly outside and speeding up the rate of cooling from what was expected. Then they analyzed the platinum isotopes, and the timing was narrowed down even further. Hunt goes on to explain, quote, our additional measurements of platinum isotope abundances allowed us to correct the silver isotope measurements for distortions caused by cosmic radiation of the samples in space. So we were able to date the timing of the collisions more precisely than ever before. And to our surprise, all the asteroidal cores we examined had been exposed almost simultaneously within a time frame of 7.8 to 11.7 .7 million years after the formation of the solar system." End quote. And all this chaos with collisions and rapid cooling likely occurred because the solar nebula, the gas left over from the sun's formation, was finally blown away by the solar winds. 
Without that gas to slow down the protoplanetary fragments, collisions became more frequent and more destructive. The early solar system was not a calm, forgiving place in the universe. And I hope we can get to see that the same is true of other systems as our exploratory observations grow more detailed. In trying to find solar systems, we do a lot of different things. We look for planets to pull their stars to and fro in ways we can see in stellar spectra. Basically, astronomers use fancy police speed guns to look for stars moving under the influence of planets. We also look for the light of stars to dip as planets pass between us and them, and in the rarest kind of discovery possible. We can sometimes catch stars passing between us and distant stars. And if those stars have planets, these systems can momentarily brighten the distant star twice, both by the star and the planet, in an effect called gravitational lensing. This effect comes straight from relativity and describes how mass can act like a lens and bend light intended for another part of the universe toward us, allowing us to see an object as brighter than it would otherwise appear. The math behind relativity is not as hard as you might think. I'd much rather solve for relativistic effects than calculate how dust clouds affect how we see things. The thing is, the maths do get complicated when you are dealing with the effects of both a star and a planet on background light. And researchers had been making a pair of different assumptions to deal with what they thought were different kinds of events. But the computers well, the computers told them they were being silly. Researchers trained an AI system to find and categorize gravitationally lensing planetary systems. And the AI unified the two systems in a way that demonstrated our simplifications caused us to miss how what we saw as two different situations are actually one situation that can are actually one situation that can appear in a variety of forms. Sometimes, in our new reality, it appears the computers are going to have a thing or two to teach their programmers. While well, understanding stellar system formation and evolution is obviously great just for the sake of science, we all know that what really gets people interested is the possibility of finding life beyond Earth and particularly on an exoplanet. Now, in new research published in Nature, astronomers show how binary star systems may be the best place to search. Project lead Jess Kirsten Jorgensen explains, quote, the result is exciting since the search for extraterrestrial life will be equipped with several new, extremely powerful instruments within the coming years. This enhances the significance of understanding how planets are formed around different types of stars. Such results may pinpoint places which would be especially interesting to probe for the existence of life." End quote. The research was done with a combination of observations of a young binary system and simulations of its possible past and future. Because of the gravitational tugs of the two stars, the gas and dust in the young system got whipped up every few hundred years. And as a result, the stars brighten as the material falls inward. These hotter episodes then further disrupt the protoplanetary disk, but could also be responsible for the creation of organic molecules. Those molecules then end up on icy bodies like comets, which then deposit their water ice and organics on rocky worlds, and voila, the building blocks for life are readily available. And with all these up-and-coming space and ground-based telescopes on the verge of being complete, we may soon observe those molecules in a distant star system. Now. Let's look back at the timeline of spaceflight with This Week in Rocket History.
This week in record history is Mercury Atlas 7. Mercury Atlas 7 was the seventh flight of Project Mercury, the U.S.'s first crewed spaceflight program. In many ways, it was similar to the sixth flight, which was also the first American orbital flight. Capsule Aurora 7 with astronaut Scott Carpenter launched from Launch Complex 14 at the Cape Canaveral Air Force Station on May 24, 1962. Five minutes later, he was in orbit, among the fastest crew descents ever. Since this was NASA's second ever crewed orbital flight, Carpenter's tasks were pretty simple. All he had to do was operate a few experiments and get back safely. The experiments included taking pictures from orbit, studying the behavior of liquids and weightlessness, and collecting data on the ionosphere. One phenomena he studied in particular was mysterious clouds of particles near the spacecraft that reflected sunlight. The nearly five hours in orbit went fine, but there were problems when Carpenter was to return. Some of the issues were because of mistakes he made, but others showed how skillful he was as a pilot. Unlike Mercury Atlas 6 with John Glenn, Carpenter was able to do more manual control of the spacecraft while in orbit. The reaction control system on the Mercury spacecraft had two separate tanks, one used by the automatic control and the other during manual control. The significance of this will be apparent later. There, this was originally planned as an experiment, but after one of the automatic systems malfunctioned, Carpenter had to take control for real. Part of the problem was that he was preoccupied looking at the mysterious particles and wasted manual control fuel in the first two orbits of his three orbit mission. Because of this error, ha because of this error, Carpenter had to conserve fuel by drifting through space uncontrolled during most of his last orbit. When it came to when it came time to deorbit, the automatic system did not work properly, so Carpenter had to maintain altitude manually during the retro burn, which used more fuel than planned. Finally, Carpenter was late initiating the deorbit burn to return him to Earth because he tried to fix the automatic system. After deorbit, he tried to resume manual control, but was unable to because the tank was empty. The automatic system mostly managed it through reentry, but its propellant was finally exhausted at an altitude of about 21 kilometers. Fortunately, the worst part of the reentry was over by then, and the capsule remained mostly in control, only swinging a few degrees out of the 10 degree limit. However, the lack of fuel and the late start of the burn resulted in Aurora 7 landing 400 kilometers downrange from the planned landing site and the automatic control system malfunction required Carpenter to manually deploy the parachutes at the right time. The retrieval team took almost an hour longer than expected to find the capsule after it splashed down. While the recovery ships knew where Carpenter would land before he got there because of radar, they had to take the time to travel to where he splashed down. The flight proved that the Mercury spacecraft was capable of supporting a human in space and returning them back to Earth safely. It also demonstrated that a human pilot could take control if needed. Future Mercury flights will be much longer, up to several days in space. Carpenter was in good physical shape after the flight, but his career wasn't. Chris Kraft, head of the NASA astronaut office, was not happy with Carpenter after he returned. In his opinion, Carpenter should not have wasted fuel looking at the mysterious particles. Carpenter never flew in space again and left NASA in 1964. He re returned to NASA in 1967 to be the executive assistant to the director of what is now called the Johnson Space Center after a brief stint in the Navy's Sea Lab project. One of the cool things he did while on Sea Lab 2 was make the first phone call from the ocean floor to outer space during the Gemini 5 mission. Oh, and those mysterious clouds of particles around the capsule? Jettisoned urine, flash frozen in space. And now for some statistics. The number of toilets in space is seven, four on the ISS, one on Soyuz MS-21, one on the Crew Dragon Freedom, and one on Tian He. We keep track of orbital launches by launch site, also called spaceport. Here's that breakdown. USA, 29, China, 16, Russia, five, Kazakhstan, three, New Zealand, three, India, one, Iran, one. From those 58 launches, a total of 1,018 spacecraft were put into orbit. Your random space fact for this week is that the returning Falcon 9 stage produces three sonic booms when it comes back through the sound barrier. 
from the bottom of the stage, the legs, and the grid fins. This has been The Daily Space. You can find more information on all our stories, including images, at dailyspace.org. As always, we're here thanks to the donations of people like you. If you like our content, please consider joining our Patreon at patreon.com slash CosmoQuestX. Pamela, Starlighter finally launched again. And everything worked? Eh, kind of. They're at least in a good orbit, headed towards the ISS. That's great. Unfortunately, Voyager 1 isn't doing so hot. At least it got to fly. There are continued concerns about a little Mars rover that might not. Space is hard. In happier stories, we're going to look at a new set of gorgeous Hubble images that help define the expansion of space. That sounds cool. Oh, and I've got another lens review. This one is about my favorite lens, the Nifty 50. That's my favorite too. I can't wait to hear what you say. All of this and more, right here on The Daily Space. I am your host, Dr. Pamela Gay. And I'm your host, Eric Mattis. And we're here to put science in your brain. On May 19th at 2254 UTC, a United Launch Alliance Atlas V N22 rocket launched the Boeing CST-100 Starliner towards the ISS. Let's watch the launch. Starliner's internal clock was right on time for the insertion burden this time, and the rendezvous so far has been nominal. It is scheduled to dock after a relatively quick 24-hour rendezvous and spend five days at the station. We'll have a full update on the rest of the mission in next week's show. The N22 is a special variant of the Atlas V with two solid rocket boosters, two RL-10 engines on the Centaur upper stage, and no fairing. The upper stage normally uses only one engine on the Atlas V, but the Centaur must fly a special flat trajectory to reduce reentry g loads on the capsule in the event of an abort on ascent. This requires more thrust, and thus, two engines. Two engines are not an unusual configuration for the Centaur. According to ULA, all Atlas and Titan launches that used a Centaur from 1962 to 2000 were dual-engine Centaurs, 167 vehicles in total. The Atlas V does not insert the Starliner all the way into orbit for a couple of reasons, mainly because it does not have the performance with the need for the special trajectory, and also because it's preferable, operationally, to burn the propellant in the spacecraft's hypergolic launch escape system prior to it reaching the ISS. The orbit insertion burn provides the opportunity to do this. The first OFT mission 29 months ago was plagued by several near-loss of vehicle events, including during insertion and overuse of propellant. Both of these were due to an incorrect mission elapsed time clock, which caused the spacecraft to think that it was further along in the flight than it actually was. Another serious issue could have happened with the service module potentially hitting the capsule before re-entry due to a software error in the fumble's disposal. 
Another serious issue could have happened with the service module potentially hitting the capsule before a reentry due to a software error in the former's disposal burn. Finally, there are intermittent comm dropouts. The inadvertent contact between the service module and capsule would have likely resulted in the spacecraft re-entering with a damaged heat shield and possibly breaking up on re-entry. The issue was only discovered when the vehicle was being reprogrammed on the fly in orbit due to the problems with the orbit insertion and propellant use. OFD-2 is being flown entirely on Boeing's dime to the tune of over $400 million because of the problems on the previous mission. If you lined up all of those dimes edge to edge, they would stretch around the world 12 times. According to Boeing, the spacecraft is as close to the crewed configuration as possible. This will shorten the time needed to certify the spacecraft to carry a crew. The crew flight test of Starliner with three NASA astronauts could be as soon as the end of this year. So, what has Boeing been doing during the 29 months since OFT-1? The launch of OFT-2 was delayed several times in early and mid-2021 because of a number of problems, not all of them Boeing's fault. One of the problems was the Russian Nauka module's docking that moved the ISS out of its correct orientation, after which NASA wanted to be sure it was okay. That was only a small problem, however, because only hours before the next launch attempt of OFD-2 on August 3rd, 2021, Boeing discovered that half of the valves in the spacecraft's thruster system were locked up. They tried to repair the capsule at the pad, but needed to take it back to the factory. This resulted in almost a year's delay. The root cause of this issue, identified over the course of several months, was moisture infiltration in the valves that caused corrosion. Boeing eventually came up with a temporary solution involving other systems, not the valve themselves. This fix was implemented on the capsule that is in space now. A proper redesign of the valves is still on the table for future vehicles. Before we went live with this episode, an update about the spacecraft's health came out. Two of the four OMAC thrusters, the biggest thrusters responsible for abort or final orbital insertion, failed during the orbital insertion burn. The still functional RCS thrusters mounted outside those big thrusters picked up the slack and the Starliner successfully made it into orbit. And now for an update on a much older spacecraft. NASA's Voyager 1 spacecraft is still cruising along in the interstellar medium 23 billion kilometers from Earth. It's not doing much, just coasting out in deep space. All of the instruments are still operating on the limited amount of power the probe can generate. This includes the high-gain antenna, responsible for sending and receiving data from the spacecraft. However, not everything is great. The spacecraft's attitude control system is working, but for some reason engineers cannot yet explain, the telemetry the spacecraft is sending back makes it seem like it is out of control, pointing in impossible directions. The engineers know Voyager 1 is still pointing where it should be because the signal is getting sent back towards us and not changing in intensity. One possible explanation for the bad telemetry is the spacecraft's constant exposure to radiation from interstellar space. Radiation is not kind to electronics. Since the spacecraft is still working, engineers have time to fix it before it becomes an issue. But if they cannot, it might end up being one of the many issues engineers just have to deal with on the 45-year-old spacecraft. For example, the main thrusters stopped functioning well, so the team switched to the backup thrusters in 2017, operating them for the first time in 37 years. Despite all these issues, Voyager 1 and 2 are expected to continue functioning through at least 2025. In the meantime, some missions are having trouble just getting off the ground. ESA's ExoMars rover, known as the Rosalind Franklin, was first supposed to launch in 2018, but problems with the landing parachute during tests delayed the mission. Then the mission was supposed to launch in a window in 2020, and while the parachute problem has been fixed, the pandemic prevented that launch date from happening. Finally, the mission was scheduled to launch this year, 
but the entire ExoMars program was a joint effort between the European Space Agency and Roscosmos, and while Russia invaded Ukraine, much to the aggravation of the rest of the world, and the member states in the European Space Agency voted to suspend the mission. For one thing, the launch vehicle was a Russian proton rocket, and secondly, the landing platform was Russian-made. The situation is leaving much of the scientific community wondering if there is any chance of a good outcome for the rover. It is possible that the U.S. can step in and save the mission, and NASA officials have confirmed that they are contemplating doing so, writing, quote, We have recently begun a joint assessment of options for the ExoMars mission. Once we know more, we will incorporate that information into our plans, end quote. It would be a shame to see this mission canceled after nearly 20 years of development and planning. But the reality is that we should prepare for bad news and hope for good. We'll keep you updated as the situation involves and wish they had waited to name the rover. Up next, we'll go back to bringing joy with a look at a new collection of Hubble images. Stay tuned. Back when I was 19, I went home from college and told my parents I was switching majors from international relations, which was kind of a pre-law program, to astrophysics. There was much parental concern that if I didn't become a lawyer or computer scientist, I'd end up unemployed. The standard arguments you've probably seen in TV shows and books ensued, and all of those many years ago. When asked what I wanted to do as an astronomer, I said I wanted to be part of the Hubble Key Project and use variable stars to try and better understand the expansion rate of the universe. While I never ended up becoming part of that great science program, I've continued to watch everything that it and its child research programs have produced. And now nearly 30 years later, the kinds of results we thought were a decade away are finally getting published. Here is the background you need to know. There is a kind of elder star called a Cepheid variable that is easy to see at large distances and gives off a standard amount of light that is correlated with how fast it pulsates. If you see a star dimming and rebrightening over three days, you can look up exactly how much light it gives off, measure how bright it appears, and calculate just how far away it is with the same kinds of maths your brain does instinctually to tell you how near or far away a motorcycle headlight is at night. Cepheids exist in our galaxy, and missions like Gaia have let us use trigonometry to survey their distances. Unfortunately, while bright, we can't see them at truly huge distances like we can with supernovae. Type 1a supernovae are also generally a very standard luminosity. They are just exploding white dwarfs that ate too much of their neighbors and one day hit a critical mass and exploded. These explosions all brighten and fade in a characteristic way. And if we can accurately measure the distance to a few of them, we can use them just like the variable stars, only to much greater distances. In a special focus issue of the Astrophysical Journal, researchers led by Adam Rees looked at the host galaxies of 42 type 1a supernovae that were close enough for his team to resolve the Cepheid variable stars in the systems. They used the variable stars to calibrate the luminosity of these supernovae and thus refine our measurements of distant galaxies. These results update our understanding of the expansion rate of the universe and yield a rate of 73.3 kilometers per second per megaparsec, with an error of just 1.04 kilometers per second per megaparsec. This means that every 3 million light years across volume of space is expanding by 73.3 kilometers every second. And we can expect our universe to double in size in 10 billion years. This is exactly the kind of science I wanted to do when I was 19, and that I'm now glad I didn't do, because it is unexpectedly controversial, and research is hard enough without adding controversy in politics. These measurements look at how our universe has been expanding 
for the past several billion years and how that rate has been changing and extrapolate back in time to tell us the age of the universe and to predict how the early universe should have been expanding. But the early universe apparently didn't read these results and decided it's going to behave somewhat differently. Using completely different techniques, researchers studying the cosmic microwave background came up with an expansion rate of 67.4 kilometers per second per megaparsec, plus or minus 0 0.5 kilometers per second per megaparsec. Well, 73.3 and 67.4 may seem like they are similar numbers. These two numbers are measured so accurately that this difference is really mind-boggling. It says there is something wrong with our understanding of how we got from the Big Bang to today. We are missing physics somewhere, and no one really knows where. A lot of, you must have errors in your measurements, and you must have errors in your physics phrases have been slung around. As an observer, I've had a theorist tell me my data was wrong because it didn't match their theory. And I really didn't enjoy that. In this situation, these 42 supernovae in 42 galaxies with visible Cepheids are here to say that the observations really are right. We really do know how the universe is going now, in the present day. We just need a new understanding of how it all started. And that remains a mystery. And I'm really glad I'm not the one trying to figure any of that out. But I get to tell you the story. Now, it's time for a lens review we promised earlier on in the show. Stay tuned. This week, we're going to take a look at one of my favorite lenses, the RF 50mm f1.8 SDM, also known as the Nifty 50. The RF 50mm f1.8 is much or the RF 50mm f1.8 is more or less the same as the EF 50mm f1.8, but updated with a new RF mount and some slight tweaks to the optics. Why many photographers use a 50mm lens is that the focal length approximates the angle of view of human vision, and the f1.8 aperture is fairly fast, allowing you to have nice bokeh in the background to make your subject stand out, while being useful in low light situations. This makes it a great lens for not much money. I bought this lens just before going on a trip where the main purpose was not photography, so I had to fit everything I needed, camera, strap, battery charger, etc. into a small camera bag. Mounted on the Canon RP, I was able to fit the body with the lens attached but the hood reversed in a jacket pocket. It served me well on the trip. The RF 50mm f1.8 has the same combination control and manual focus ring found on other smaller RF lenses, like the 60mm f2.8 and the 24-105 SDM. Since getting my R6, I've found a new love for the control ring as it allows me to use it as an aperture ring instead of controlling the aperture through the dial on the camera body. It has only one switch that changes between focus and control functions. Despite the small, si Despite the small size, it is still easy to hold. Image quality isn't bad, especially for the price, though my R6's mere 20 megapixels are more forgiving. The only bad part is that the corners are a little soft and there is some chromatic aberration, especially with branches, but the latter can be cleaned up by applying a lens profile in post-processing. Another change with the RF version of the Nifty 50 is a slightly higher magnification ratio of 0.25 compared to the EF's version's 0.21. The RF 50mm can focus as close as 30cm from the sensor. This increase in magnification ratio is a characteristic of several inexpensive RF lenses, including the 24-105 STM and the 16-2.8 and it is the result of being able to place large lens elements closer to the sensor in the mirrorless mount. The one disappointing thing about this lens is its focus motor. The SDM motor is loud as it focuses. I was honestly shocked at how loud it is, as between the STM and USM focus motor technologies, the STM motor is supposed to be the quieter one. It is also slow to focus, particularly going from one end of the focus range to the other, and it occasionally focuses on the wrong thing even if the subject is stationary. 
This is particularly the case when using servo autofocus with I plus tracking mode. The R6 has a fantastic